five, four, three, two, one. The Sofa Club is live. Five, four. Oh, am I on? I'm on. Very exciting. Hello, everybody. I knew that this was beginning right now. My name is uh, Jazza. Uh, you will know me from such things as the Internet and also specifically the podcast Queer Movie Podcast, which I host with the wonderful Rowan Ellis. The first episode that we ever did on that podcast was a review of the 2014 classic uh, GBF. Uh, and we are here today joined um courtesy of peccadillo pictures um and as part of the sofa club um three uh people who made that film possible i'm joined by uh george northey the uh, writer and producer uh michael j willett the actor musician who of course plays tanner and has a wonderful uh mane of black hair now i'm <laughs> like it looks really quite beautiful shake that out amazing and of course also darren stein the director hello everybody hello, hello. hi excellent um uh, how is everybody kind of like obviously we're doing this remotely because we are in <clears throat> unprecedented times. Um, uh, and I just wanted to kind of like break the ice a little bit by asking off the bat, um, what films um, are you kind of like using to pass the start time while you're in lockdown? George, I'll start with you, if that's OK. Um, films. So what is the film we just watched? Um we're watching a lot of TV. I really like the show What We Do in the Shadows. It's really good. Oh, um, big fans. Very, a lot of light stuff. It's, it's nice at this moment. Um, but we just watched uh, I, uh, Circus of Books on Netflix, which is amazing and made me cry. And it's about, of course, an LA institution. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. I think like anything that kind of uh, is a little escapist, light, but... Um, just fun. Mm -hmm. And so, something that can make you cry as well. I watched um, a Circus of Books and cried at least three times throughout the telling of that story. It was really quite yeah. beautiful. Um, Darren, how about you? What have you been watching while on lockdown? Um, I just watched um, Pedro Almodovar's All About My Mother. Oh, my God. Good choice. Right. I have to watch these comfort movies. You know, it's just a very comforting film to watch. Um, I then went back to his very early punk rock movie, Lab Labyrinth of Passion. Um, but TV wise, I'm watching like George, I'm watching What We Do in Shadows, um, which I think is so brilliant. Um, doing a lot with genre, with horror, taking it to new places. I mean, the tone is hilarious. I'm also watching, um, what's the drag queen uh, with uh, Eureka on We're Here on HBO? Yes. Oh, uh, right. yes. Well, I'm I, I'm not allowed to watch that, obviously, because I'm in a different country and it's not available. I'm definitely not using other methods to see. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yeah. Circus of Books is an incredible doc documentary as well. George mentioned it. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. And okay. Michael, how are you spending your time in lockdown? Are you watching anything in particular? I love that we're matching. This was actually kind of yes. bad viewers. I but. feel like I inspired you a little bit. Like, oh, just just to tell a lie. Okay. <laughs> um, so I am kind of like in a phase of comfort, and so I'm watching a lot of like, I'm oscillating between a lot of old faves and like trashy new reality show faves. So I'm like, you know, your favorite uh, or, or my classic uh, Rosemary's Baby. Um, <laughs> you know, I like to turn that one on right before I go to bed. And uh, and then I've been watching. I just watched the docu series, The Tiger King. Oh my god! I was wondering how long it would be until somebody brought yeah. up the Tiger King. I had to. Sorry, it, it was me. I had to do it. Um, <laughs> Tiger King and uh, Ninety Day Fiance. My friends got me into that one, and it's horribly addicting, and I don't feel good about it. But. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> I really like that now. The Tiger King has meant that what would have been our summer wardrobes is going to be full of animal print and big cats. Uh, and right. I'm OK with that now being part 
of gay culture. <laughs> I'm totally I'm totally fine with that aesthetic that we're now all going to be rocking in the future. Um, <laughs> so heard, we're here. Um, oh, go on, George. New song. Everything must be leopard print. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Check it out. Excellent. <laughs> Will do. Um, uh, we are here to kind of like celebrate. Hopefully, some of the people in the chat um, and everybody in the chat. Hello. Good to see you. Um, uh, uh, thanks for coming. Um, if you can leave your questions in the chat, then I will be relaying them to our wonderful guests um, here today, as and when. Um, I we're obviously here to celebrate um, GBF as kind of like we're allowed to call it an institution now, I think. Um, uh, uh, Dan, George, can you tell me how the movie kind of like came to be? How did this little little baby of yours um, uh, reach conception? Well, I think, George, you start because you wrote it. Uh, OK, um, so I wrote GBF in a screenwriting class that I was taking in New York. I, I'd been working in advertising as a uh, copywriter for many years, but I've been taking classes just kind of to kind of expand my creative, you know, output, um, not really intending to actually get anything made. Um, but I really fell in love with the screenwriting uh, when I took that class and GBF kind of just like poured out of me. It was very much just kind of felt like a natural thing. And it was um, inspired originally by this uh, article, I think it was in Teen Vogue that kind of was circulating the whatever, whatever, it wasn't social media. I mean, Twitter was, I don't think existed back then, but whatever it was, it was, I saw people posting this article as like very ironic, and ironically saying that gay best friends were the best new accessory. And there was a one specific line that really inspired me that was like, some girl said, there's only one per school in a lot of places. So you, get, you have to fight over the, the gay best friend. And that, I, as soon as I read that sentence, I was like, that's a teen movie of all the, the uh, girls fighting over the one gay in their high school to get this status symbol. And I thought it was a great way to satirize this kind of idea of like commodification and accessorizing people and, and um, kind of uh, this tokenism or whatever. Um, so then I just kind of took like every teen movie I've ever loved and seen from you know, Mean Girls to the John Hughes movies to um, Easy A was a big inspiration and kind of like mashed them together into one storyline and kind of took everything I wanted, I loved from all those and kind of merged them all together. So then um, I kind of had the screenplay that I liked, but I had no idea what to do with it. So um, I, I got it into the Outfest screenwriting lab and then um, that's when things started to change for me where Darren, uh, Darren got the script because he was assigned to direct my um, short reading of, of like a, a couple scenes from it during Outfest and he kind of I remember getting the email from Darren where he said oh I'm gonna read it over the weekend and then he emailed me on like Sunday and he's like all it said was George oh my god I want to direct this and so <laughs> we kind of I was like great that's kind of the best reaction I could have gotten so then um from then on we had been ever since we started working on it together we just said like let's try to just find a way to make this and and that's where Darren comes in. So continue the story. Oh, Darren, yeah, take the baton. Take it away. How, <laughs> how did you become a daddy? Um, I, was, I was directing uh, scenes from Outfest, you know, screenplays for their screenwriting lab. I got GBF and read it and was bl completely blown away by the writing. I thought it was really beautifully written, hilarious. It was a teen movie that I hadn't seen before. And that, to me, is what made it so special. Because I was like, if I'm going to revisit that genre, it has to be a, a, a screenplay that's doing something new with it. And I love that he had like the, the slow motion walks, which Jawbreaker funnily sort of helped invent. But he was yeah. doing it in a way that I hadn't seen, which was each girl had their own, you know, dominion. And then the gay best friend joins the slow motion walk. And it just reinvented a cinematic language that I thought was really an interesting continuum of what I had done. So I love George. Um, and we just went about finding a producer, which was Stephen Israel, finding the fi cobbling together the financing, which was a process. But um, in, the, in the scheme of things, this film came together pretty fast. You know, usually, yeah. it take, usually it takes a film, I don't know, years, decades to get made. Um, this one came, came, came out pretty fast and, yeah. uh, and was made for you know, a, very, a very small budget. But we all just we threw in everything that we had, you know, to make. Because to me, I thought 
it needs a teen movie needs the music, it needs the visuals, it needs the fashion. If it doesn't look like it can, it can stand up against Clueless and films like, yeah, you know, the John Hughes films, you know, I didn't want to make it. And that was the fun challenge was casting it, casting it within an inch of its life and creating a visual palette and a, and a, and a, a stylistic sophistication that made it rise to the occasion. Mm-hmm. Talking about the stellar casting, maybe we should bring in uh, the uh, the poster boy, I suppose, of um, uh, uh, of GBF, <laughs> Michael. Um, what I, I I don't know what the process is like, but I guess you get the script. And what was your kind of uh, reaction to it after um, reading it and realizing that you might have to wear spray tan? <laughs> well. I actually was a part of the workshop at Outfest, and I don't remember how I received it, but it was probably through my like manager or something, um, and it was just for the reading, and then it, we I had done several readings after that, but basically, like, my experience was that anyone who read the script, like, got it instantly. It was, it was very clear that it, like, what was on the page, like, you could visualize it, and you can imagine it, and even when we were doing the reading, it, it popped, like, it just had this, like, electricity to it that everyone was aware of, like, if, if you were in the vicinity, you understood what this project was, and what it was supposed to, like, feel like, and look like, and what the characters were, and so, um, from that point on, to me, it was just a matter of like refining it over and over. But my 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 initial response to it was like, I get what this is. This is what I've been wanting to be a part of. Mm-hmm. That's re- that's really amazing. Um, George, I saw a, an interview an interview of you from uh, I think 2014, um, uh, uh, where you talked about the fact that when you were first kind of writing it, that there were loads of the ending, there were different endings that kind of like came up that ended up on the cutting room floor. What were some possible different endings? I heard you talk about the fact that there was a roller disco um, incorporated into it. And why was that? Yeah. Cut? I, I can't really remember. I think I, there definitely was like a roller themed prom at the end, just because like, I think I was just like, I want to have a roller themed prom at the end. Why not? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, uh, I think eventually uh, there was a version of it where there were two different proms. I remember like where the the kids who uh, yes. kind of, I think it was inspired by what was actually happening in America at that time when sometimes like if there was like a queer inclusive prom, then the like conservatives would go off and have their own prom to like, and it would just kind of create this like schism. So that was the original vision for the ending. There were like two different proms. And then at one point Tanner was going to have to like roller skate from one prom to the other. I remember picturing that as like a big scene, a big moment. I'm, I'm mad um, that that didn't happen. That <laughs> sounds amazing. I think it was, I think it was a lot of, um, that was in the notes process where and when Darren and I were developing the script and refining it and figuring out what was possible that we started um, kind of narrowing in on one prom um, for production and also for story reasons. Um, and I remember, I think of some other alternate things. I, there was originally, a whole storyline in which um, Zosha Rockmar's character Caprice and um, Molly Tarlov's character Sophie had like a secret romance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that kind of fell out when we kind of needed to just focus in on the kind of conflict between uh, Caprice and Fawcett and their kind of battle because it kind of became about them battling over Tanner. Um, so then that storyline kind of shifted um, those are the two things that I can remember really, really being different. But the the core of it was pretty close, especially like the first uh, two thirds of the film always was kind of pretty locked in. And then um, the, the the ending changed a couple times as we developed it. Mm-hmm. George, Michael, how would have you felt oh, yeah. about um, uh, uh, having to roller skate? Can you can you roller skate? Okay, <laughs> secret top maybe not so top secret. I love roller skating, and literally, my last birthday was at the roller rink. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, my God. I mean, I feel like yeah. there's a missed opportunity. Maybe yeah. there is a possible remake that could be done. Yeah. Maybe it can be turned into kind of like a stage production. This needs yeah, to be Xanadu, reworked, everyone. Starlight Express vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> I remember an ending where, George, you, you probably remember better than I do, but, like, there was, like, text messages in the credits 
like Tanner oh, had a yeah. boyfriend. Oh, there was like a flash forward at one point. That's yes. It. You're right. So it was like, it turns into a thing where there was originally like kind of like a flash forward where you find out that Tanner has been telling the story of how he came out to like this guy in, on his like in his college dorm. And then like, and then he's like, okay, that was a really long story. Can we make out now? Or something like that. That yeah. was the end. <laughs> um, and then that, that was kind of like a way of being like, oh, that's why this was had a voiceover all to, to begin with. It was all Tanner telling the story to a, to a guy who thought was cute. And it's also, I think that was a way of giving them, um, giving him like a little bit of like, cause you know, he doesn't end up with Brent, um, Brent, um, but he does get his own little romance at the end. Um, but I don't know why that that came out. I don't know why that fell out either, but um, it was kind of one of the things where we just felt like it, it had a good ending the way it was. And, and uh, people can imagine that ending for Tanner uh, years later. <laughs> and it was cute because Brent would be texting Tanner. Oh, yes, yes. Like little things. So like while the credits were rolling, like hit Brent's texts would come up. Anyway, I always thought that was a cute idea. That was cute. Mm -hmm. oh well <laughs> it's okay there'll be there'll be other opportunities my friends other opportunities um there have been some really uh wonderful questions in the comments thanks everybody and do keep them coming um we had a question from um jamie about the ending actually uh, uh and this is one of my favorite parts of the movie as well where the prom signs are the best easter eggs uh jamie asks were those conceived by you or were they from the minds of the prop department whose kind of like uh brainchild was that it was a combination, right? Yeah, I think we made a list of like, of like, here's some signs, potential signs, and then also just said, go with whatever you want and make make some based on these kind of ideas. But they wanted them to be like both offensive and silly. So hopefully that came across. <laughs> I feel like there's some very provocative ones that maybe helped, <laughs> maybe helped earn the film an R rating. <laughs> yeah. could, could, could have been that, yeah. Perhaps the the one thing the one main thing that I remember from the protest um, scenes is uh, the the religious antagonist I can't remember her name has Leviticus numbers underneath um, <laughs> yeah. her eyes as if it's kind of like um, sports paint and the, I remember the moment I realised that I was like oh, Easter egg oh, I loved it it was really quite brilliant um, we have a question from Mark as well from the comments um, uh, uh, and Mark asks. How open is Hollywood to LGBTQ characters and creatives? Have things changed much since you made uh, GBF? Uh, Michael, I know that you've spoken in the past about how, um, despite what people may think that your um, uh, uh, kind of identity has been a positive for you and it's helped you in your career rather than the general stereotype of it being a negative. How has stuff changed for you as, a, as an actor and a performer since GBF, perhaps? Um, yeah, I always felt like it was something that what kept me like when whenever I'd go into acting classes or situations, they would always say like, be specific that, that and then there's always people who are always like, urging you to be more generic. And and so I felt like being gay was something a I couldn't hide and b that made me more specific. And I think that in general, I've noticed that there are so many more gay characters and gay storylines since GBF, for sure. Mm -hmm. How has it been being kind of like the uh, director, Dan, for you? I don't, think, I don't think being a gay director makes a difference at all. You know, I mean, the biggest thing that I saw on GBF was getting the R rating for that movie, which really deserved a PG-13. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I think if it, were, if it was heterosexual um, actors story slang, it would have gotten a PG-13. But because it was talking about gay sex and gay specific slang, I think it was considered more risque. And the heterosexuals at the NPAA gave it an R rating, which I think is, you know, sort of silly, you know, but that's, that's the only yeah. thing I, I can say about that. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Yeah. yeah I George, did you want to come in? Sorry. I think, um, yeah, I think that's the only kind of obstacle. I, I think the definitely this movie got made because of its LGBT subject matter and whenever it existed without it, um, it was kind of a way to find a, a new take on something. And I think it's only gotten more inclusive 
since then. Um, and I'm really, I'm really proud actually that we had two openly uh, queer actors play our, our two gay leads, like, which is, I think, a rarity. Um, and I think it brings, I think they bring, like, like Michael said, a specific specificity and an authenticity to those parts. Like, not that straight people can't play gay characters, but I think that there is a very, there's a sense that there, there's a realness to it that I think really worked well for the, for the film. And I think uh, I'm really happy about that part. Also, we should, we had to share a little goss, right? A little goss on this. Oh, we, yes, please. Uh, I mean, Michael, you and um, Paul were kind of like dating during the movie. So I think that whole thing like helped bring some realism to it. I mean, it was just what? It was like an onset romance, right? Yeah. It was like a, a little flirtation. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was like the real chemistry for sure. I, I've had, I think it's hard to not when, especially as an actor, like when you're in those situations where you're constantly like entertaining those thoughts about this person and finding ways to connect with them. It's hard to separate fantasy and reality. Those lines get super blurry. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. What do you think, do you think that um, a remake, and I think about the um, piece of the live action um, as well, um, uh, what do you think is happening there in terms of queer representation? Darren, you look like you're, you're chomping at the bit. Well, I think you're talking about big studio movies, mm. which I think is still a bit of a hurdle, honestly. But I think in the streaming capacity, people are engaging hundred percent. I mean, look at sex education and series, look at Pose, look at even movies like Alex Strangelove, which is a queer streaming movie. I mean, if you look at the studio queer movie, that was Love, Simon. And to me, that was made, that had to become more, more generic. They cast heterosexual actors in those leads. And to me, it didn't read as authentic because of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I think there's peril. I, I think we're still at a moment where we're figuring out how in a big studio context to tell gay queer stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree with, with what Darren said. Yeah, I think it, I mean, there's a, definitely this story was a very specific of its time story. I remember when we were making it, I was like, we have to make it soon. Otherwise the idea of one gay kid be, being in a high school would be, will, will be un, unconceivable. Cause you know, like they'll just, kids are coming out earlier and earlier now. Um, so it kind of is of a moment of like the, the, the exact plot line of, of that movie is very much in that time. But um, so I think this specific uh, film had to be made at that moment. But I think the idea of, yeah, like a, a, a movie like GBF being made again would, yeah, would feels more like a Netflix or a Amazon um, major studio maybe <laughs> mm -hmm. we actually had a question about this from david in the chat and please keep those questions coming dear viewers um how he um david asks um how did the film reflect attitudes in american high schools in 2013 um you kind of answered that george but how do you think it has changed uh since then i mean it's it's not too long ago it's uh, just over half a decade ago um uh but do you think that we really are in kind of like a a, a better place when it comes to that uh experience of being a, a queer kid growing up i think i think in some ways it's completely much more accepting you know uh with fluidity and tra transness being more spoken of and it's definitely represented now in TV and film and characters, which is easier for kids to come out earlier and be who they are earlier, transition earlier, all that great stuff. But conversely, I do feel like since we live in America, you know, the whole world is so, you know, like torn apart with like the red versus the blue, the conservative versus the liberals. And I think there's still, it's just very dangerous as well. Never been more dangerous actually in some capacities. So I think there's still danger there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But while, while, while also having their big, you know, there's freedom. I mean, with more freedom comes more, you know, more polarity, it seems. Mm -hmm. There's no freedom that we haven't had to fight for, something along those lines. That is a misquote from someone at some point. <laughs> um, there's quite a, a quite a playful comment from Lee in the uh, in the in the chat. Um, and it is specifically for you, Michael. I don't know why it wasn't um, uh, directed at any of the other um, people here. But how come Michael doesn't look any older now than when GBF was made? What is your secret? <laughs> um, witchcraft. 
Uh, I dabble in the occult. That is true. Um, I don't know. I'm part Filipino. I just. <laughs> there, I we do. There, there we go. There we go. We've uncovered it. It's uh, a yeah. worshipping witchcraft um, and having a diverse lineage. Yes. Excellent. As it goes. That combo is it's unbeatable. Yeah, I, I I mean I um did a 23andMe DNA test and it turns out I'm 99.6% uh, white British, um uh, so I'm buggered is essentially, <laughs> essentially okay. um what we you say. Can, you can only hope. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean I'm just uh, moisturized constantly. That's the secret. <laughs> um, uh, uh, a question for um for um George I think and actually I'm I'm curious to see what um uh, the other two have to say about this, um. Some of the, uh, you talked about the, the writing really resonating when you guys uh, wrote it. Uh, and some of the terminology and the quotes in the movie are um, in are amazing. Um, I remember when we reviewed the movie, one of our favorite lines um, was Fawcett um, entering a room and, room and saying, everyone can relax. The people who matter have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, which is something that I say in my head whenever I do enter a new <laughs> new room uh, to this day. Um, and then there's uh, stuff like uh, he's um, uh, he's spray tanner now. Um, uh, the uh, story we talk behind what gay bees actually mean, not gay babies, but gay babies. Um, uh, uh, George, ha- like, admit it. How much of that is yours? And what is happening in your poor mind when you're coming <laughs> up with that? I love things like wordplay and puns. And I thought, and I definitely like when the, you know, I grew up on things like Buffy and Dawson's Creek where like they're teen shows, but the language is always heightened. Like, you know, they, they talk a little bit in their own language. Cause like another thing I think we talked about, Darren and I was like, we didn't want it to be so slang specific to a time because it's, that gets dated very quickly. I mean, sure. Lots of stuff in the movie is I'm sure dated now, but, but we wanted it kind of like to invent stuff, just invent your own words and your own slang um, to kind of have this high school be kind of where these kind of things are coming from so that it kind of will feel a little more timeless um, despite, you know, the the things that don't make it timeless. (laughs) But um yeah, and I think like anything just to kind of play with like a slightly heightened world and just anything that, that just sounded funny and silly to me, I just threw in. And the, the original script was like so long, it was, like, because it was my first screenplay. And I was like, it was way too long for a, for a feature, um, for a comedy feature. But we just threw all the jokes in and then we would kind of cut them on set or cut them in the, um, you know, in, in, on, in the editing phase. But um just kind of tried to just throw in every possible funny thing mm-hmm. I could think of. <laughs> it, it is in, oh, sorry, go on, Dan. No, I'm just saying George has got such a great way with words and his <laughs> language and his puns and, and that rhythm and, and the imagination behind it is what was just such so magical about the script to begin with. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it really feels like a, in, in certain ways, it feels like a love letter to a lot of the, the teen um, high school movie genre, um, but with kind of like the gay main character and the gay twist that a lot of queer kids were perhaps um, uh, uh, in, uh, like projecting onto them when we were watching them um, when we were younger, right? Um, uh, Dan, you've you've dabbled in in the genre um, every so often. I hear Jawbreak is a thing. Um, uh, <laughs> what is it that about like the the teen high school genre that is kind of like appealing for you anyway as a director? Um, I mean, high school is like a hot house, you know, it's where everything is heightened. You're, you're, you're freshly like dealing with all your hormones and your adolescence and the stakes are life and death, although they're really not. They seem like they are because you're, you know, 16 and it's all about belonging and feeling part of and lo- losing your virginity by prom. It's just a very fun genre to explore. And as a kid, I really loved films like Grease, Carrie, Hollow, um, Grease, Carrie, Heathers and Rock and Roll High School, a lot of teen movies. <clears throat> so it's a genre, I don't know, that, maybe also because I went to an all boy, a very conservative all boy school in LA, kind of like like academic and sports oriented, very hetero, so I couldn't live my fabulous gay life there at all. Like you need, I couldn't live my high school fantasy in, in high school because it was just all boys, you know what I'm saying? So I lived my, so my, <laughs> so my, I, I love, I love it because where is the lie? Like it's so, 
hundred percent how we all felt. No, gay yeah. boys, gay boys <laughs> need the girls to give them power, and that's what GBF's about. That's why GBF spoke to me so trend- tremendously. <laughs> you know, when, I, when I read GBF, I was like, oh my god, yes, you know, this people are going to yeah. relate. Um, and uh, and Jawbreaker was the dark side of that, the dark, angry sort of like fuck the world, you didn't accept me. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna, I'm gonna force the jock to give head to a big stick now because because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's the scene that I want to yeah. see that's the, that's the scene that I wanted to see when I was 16 that I, I couldn't see I had to watch Molly Ringwald get laid whatever you know so <laughs> <laughs> create the reality that you want to see in the world children yeah. that's what we're learning from this well, um, the, being a filmmaker a writer a director actor you get to tell you get to you get to create the content and tell the stories you know um, we were talking earlier, uh, and I said to you, Dan, that I was watching kind of like an an, an early documentary about your uh, your time as kind of like a kid um, making like these short screenplay screenplays and films um, with all of the kids that lived on your um, on your street, uh, and it really kind of like resonated me as because I um, started on YouTube, and it kind of reminded me of um, the way that people were using the medium to tell stories. Um, uh, uh, kind of like back then what do you guys see um in kind of like each of your disciplines um what do you guys see uh kind of like the youth currently doing to express themselves that are maybe going to go on to uh tell really cool interesting stories that maybe haven't been told before in the same way that gbf was is it tiktok I think I, it might be michael why don't you start you're the youngest oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay <laughs> I am I'm actually like really excited to see what's coming up next because there are so many new like ways of looking at how to tell story um things I've never even considered like 3D all kinds of stuff like things I've never so I think there's an endless potential infinite possibility i'm really excited um also a little intimidated not gonna lie <laughs> mm-hmm. but they're uh, all so young and talented uh yeah. Darren, are you seeing kind of like anything what's the equivalent of um kind of like the kid running around with a camera and directing all of his friends nowadays do you think um i would have to say the other day i was in hancock park on a on a, on a quarantine on a social distance date we wore masks. <laughs> Don't worry, mask for mask. Six feet apart, right there. <laughs> it was happening, but on the corner of the street. Congratulations! Just no no hand holding. That's all. No hand holding. No French kissing in the USA. It was very chaste, <laughs> <laughs> which I must say is not very satisfying. But that being said, uh, on the corner we saw these <laughs> these three or four girls. They had a tripod. The iPhone was on a tripod. And they were doing like a choreographed dance number, I think, for, t- for probably for TikTok. But I just like that, you know, that the creative process is becoming more, in a way more organized, more democratic, more uh, the social language. I, I like I hear from the kids TikToks on their Instagram, right? So, so in a way, the kids are being forced to tell these little stories, these little tidbits. I mean, look, look, look at Quibi. Quibi is now making content in six minute chunks. I mean, essentially, they're just taking a half-hour series and they're breaking it into six-minute segments, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I Quibi's think that- like the it's the the mobile, not just mobile first, but it's mobile only kind of like TV shows, essentially, right? Isn't it? Yeah, you have to watch yeah. on your. Phone. But mm-hmm. now I I hear they're changing it so you can mirror it to your TV now. <gasps> Exciting. Because you could, because frankly, people, I think, I think they're realizing that nobody really likes. Well, the kids do, but like most people I know or whatever don't like watching content on their phone. I mean, why would you want? Yeah. Hi, Michael's boyfriend. I see you in the back. <laughs> You're on the air and saying hi. hi. <laughs> uh, 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 everyone's saying hi. Hello. Thanks for ruining the stream. Oh, I just shamed him. Sorry. Come by. Walk in the back. It's okay. <laughs> but no, I think I think I think that kids, in a way, are being forced to tell a story visually because of TikTok and because it's becoming more, and, and because of Instagram Instagram stories. You know, I don't know. I, I think it's good. I think it's just making people more creative. 
Um, somebody has noted uh, Michael's partner running around in the background and said, rather than it being an interrupted BBC or CNN interview, um, uh, uh, rather than a wife running in to grab the kids, it's a gay running in to get the get the dog. Um, <laughs> yes, that's uh, exactly what was happening. Classic. Exactly. <laughs> it's okay. We're all totally chill. Everything's normal. Um, uh, uh, George, you mentioned um, that um, the kind of like uh, outfest uh, class that you used as a, as a way to be able to kind of like break into the, the writing scene. And um, Mark actually asked about this in the uh, in the comments as well uh, and asked what kind of programs are there for like LGBTQ plus um, newcomers who want to tell stories? What are what's what's available now? Um, well, Alfest is a great one that has a lot of uh, opportunities. That's an LA based uh, thing, of course. So it's not you. I don't I'm not familiar with a lot of the UK ones. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, there's lots of different, like, kind of diversity based um, programs. Um, but in general, I think it's like, you can't really rely on that, because it's like, there's really small amounts of people who get into those things. I think it's now it's more than ever, it's about creating your own stuff, wherever you are, you know, because I think a lot of times it used to be where you could break into TV with just like a script that's like your Seinfeld or your friends, you know, like you just write an episode of that and that's all you needed to become a TV writer. But now it's like really about what have you made? What have you done? Like, and it's, and a lot of it is just about having created something, whether it's a web series, whether it's your indie film, whether it's a TikTok that's got really popular or whatever. Um, you kind of have to be just be constantly creating in addition to writing, I think, to to get in that door. Um, mm -hmm. Or and then there's also like in TV, there's the whole kind of assistant route. So you can also try to get one of these assistant jobs that leads to writing. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess uh, that's my main advice. Mm -hmm. It's great. Thank you. Uh, I had a uh, we have a question or kind of like a, 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 a suggestion from Lee that uh, we're guessing that GBF2, the roller disco, isn't on the cards. Um, sadly, uh, we'll, we'll shelve that um, uh, kind of like desire for now um, uh, uh, and maybe come back to it at a later date. Um, but I'd love to know what uh, and Lee would like to know as well, what kind of projects you guys are all work, working on uh, uh, at the moment. Darren, I know you have some very exciting news, and you are feel free to share. It's it's not news, and it's not it hasn't happened yet. But I'm, I'm is that I'm, not news? Is it, is it not predictions for the future? Well, you know, you know, I will say, you know, George and I have written several pilots together, and separately, and just because they announce a pilot being written doesn't mean it ever gets the light of the light of day. So, yeah. But, but I am I am pitching Jawbreaker as a movie musical remake right now and t today i actually just had the call with sony about it and so we're not sure yet if it would be a streaming thing or a theatrical thing or even maybe a six to eight episode half hour series but yes i am i am pitching jawbreaker as a musical because we actually developed me and jeff jo uh, jeff thompson and jordan mann this uh, songwriting team developed it for the stage over the past several years and now we are you know, Mean Girls and Heathers are both musicals, and now Mean Girls is being remade as a movie musical. Heathers is all over iTunes. I mean, it's like Jawbreaker needs to catch up with it with with her sisters. You know, <laughs> she's she's always been she's always been the sort of you know Fern Mayo of the group. So it's, it's time, time she's the her. punk rock version. Yeah, of the sister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, Michael, you're also like dabbling in a little bit of um, music. Uh, uh, as well. And what else are you kind of like working on at the minute? Well, I kind of like along the lines of what we were saying, like it's good to do a lot of different things in this industry, or maybe just now that's just the world we live in, you know? And so, yeah, along with acting, I also create my own th content and things. Um, I The last project, acting project I did was uh, Dolly Parton's Heartstrings, uh, which is on Netflix. Um, I'm in one episode on there, and which uh, which is like the LGBT episode. And um, I'm also I do a lot of like art, like graphic design and such. And but most what I'm most excited about is my music, which is coming out in a couple of months. Um, it's called Pink Sunglasses, and it's all about like 
like looking at the world more lovingly and more positively. And um, I, it's all on my, my ukulele and guitar and um, yeah, so it's going to be fun and it's very uplifting. And so I'm really excited about it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the kind of stuff that we might need these days. Uh, yes. So looking forward to it. Um, you can also check out some of your music um, uh, on your YouTube channel, right? Oh yeah. And I'm also on um, all, uh, online platforms sorry online platforms uh, spotify and soundcloud um i have my old music i did an album called regeneration um which sounds a lot different from what i'm doing now which is a little more like um raw and acoustic but mm -hmm. it's still good very exciting yeah. george how about you what are you do up to at the moment um nothing i can really like pitch you right now um but uh darren and i sold a pilot last development season um, to the CW. It didn't go forward this round, but we don't know what's gonna happen with it in the future. So we're kind of gonna try to see what happens either at CW or somewhere else with that. Um, and then another pilot I, I wrote for NBC is interesting and could play, we could uh, hopefully shop that around. Um, and then in the meantime, I'm working on just um, new, new stuff. I'm uh, developing a, a kind of a kids movie that I'm saying is in the vein of Hocus Pocus. So kind yes. of a fun, um, fun family movie with a with a big producer that'll hopefully be pitching soon. Oh, um, I approve hard. <laughs> and then an animated pod project I'm really excited about. Um, so just like lots of different stuff. I like playing with all in all the different genres. So I'm excited about that stuff. Yeah, all all of these people are on social medias. So um, Google them and follow them. You fools in the chat. I'm looking at you. I can see you. Um, I kind of wanted to do uh, one last question to like wrap up a little bit. Um, so on the uh, uh, queer movie podcast, Rowan and I, for every movie that we review, we have a single question that we ask at the end and we ask, how would you have made this movie gayer? <laughs> now I want to know how in retrospect with the years under your belt since, how would you have made GBF gayer? I'm going to go to George first. Um, well, I probably would have uh, kept that storyline where uh, uh, Caprice and Sophie made out. Um, that would have made it much scare. Um, I think, I think um, the version of it, of GBF that would be now, that's a little, would, would be more inclusive with like trans people and gender fluidity and, and um, sexual fluidity. Like, I think it would be a very different uh, world that it would take place now. Um, so yeah, it would just be a lot more um, just fluid, I guess. <laughs> cool. Michael, how about you? How would you have made uh, the film get? The roller skating <laughs> is, is on the cards. Um, yes. Um, but also feel free to have you making out with um, more sexy people. It's up to you. Well, I do just... For the record, I do think there's a difference between gay and queer. 100%. And, yeah. And so I think, and I'm more interested in doing something more queer. And because of where we're at with like drag culture and stuff, I think there would be probably a scene where Tanner gets dressed up in drag, maybe. Oh, amazing. I love gets that. In drag. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think I would make it, I mean, I would have Tanner transition. You know, no, 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 Tanner. No, Tanner has like a drag hobby, and he wants to be on Drag Race. He could send tape into that. Yeah. Uh, make it a musical, right? Making something yeah. a musical always makes it gay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> once, gay. <laughs> once, once you're finished with the Jawbreaker uh, convert, we can work on GBF. Yes, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody, for um, having coming and having a chat. Um, uh, all the way from sunny California. Um, uh, uh, it was a long trip for you, obviously, with all of these Skype calls. Um, uh, but thank you very much. If you all want to say, this is the awkward bit where we end the call, but you know that you're still on the call with me. Um, but does everybody want to say goodbye now? Yes. Bye, guys. Thank you. Aloha. Watching. Goodbye. <laughs> Aloha. Goodbye. Aloha. Goodbye. I'm now going to wait until... I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Excellent. Very exciting. So thank you, everybody, for 
watch stop speaking in my ears everybody um uh thank you very much for uh coming to this uh peccadillo pictures um uh sofa club movie club sofa club um uh we have had a lovely time thank you for all of your questions it's been really quite lovely make sure that you share this video around to all of your friends like comment and subscribe i wouldn't be a proper youtube person if i didn't ask you to do that we will be returning um with my co-host of the queer movie podcast rowan ellis on this thursday on the 30th of april where she will be talking to desiree akavan about appropriate behavior so all you have to do is watch the film at 7 p.m pm british standard uh british summertime uh and then you can join us here for the live q a from 8 45 um so here is the trailer for appropriate behavior for you exciting yes my name is shireen I'm contact lens Iranian came out bisexual teacher <laughs> And I would like to take you out for a drink. When are you going back to work? <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not letting you fall into a bottomless pit of despair and unemployment. It says in your file that you haven't worked a shift in four months. Extenuating circumstances. I've had a very broken heart. I'm like one bad romantic encounter away from moving to France and changing my identity. Um, I'm looking for the grown-up underwear of a woman in charge of her sexuality and not afraid of change. I've got that. Have we met before? I don't think so. I used to be a hair model, so you might recognize me from that. Yeah, that's probably it. They have no idea you're bisexual? They know I know they know. Why is there only one bed? It's European. Also in the movie Beaches, these two best friends shared a bed and it was very inexpensive. She has this like younger child thing. She has no goals or aspirations. She takes nothing seriously. And she's becoming a loser. You are ruining my birthday. You're ruining my 20s. <laughs> you are a woman and you have breasts and there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah, I know. You deserve a sexy, supportive bra just like any other woman. Okay.